In the first century AD, the Mediterranean world had undergone vast cultural changes under the uncontested domination of the Roman Empire. Egypt became an imperial province of Rome in the 30s BC, and would continue as such for nearly 700 years. Syria, along the Mediterranean's eastern bank, was annexed to Rome in the 60s BC, and remained under Roman dominion for the next 400 years. And Judea, now called modern-day Israel, had been an ally of the Roman Empire for some time past, but became an official Roman province in its own right in 6 AD. This first century was a time of great anticipation, great anxiety, and great uncertainty. The Jewish people in all Judea had historical wounds, trading off overlords and foreign rulers since the time of the great Babylonian exile under Nebuchadnezzar. Judea had also been steamrolled by Alexander the Great in the 300s BC with his ingenious and revolutionary Macedonian phalanx stratagem. But in this first century, following aggressive Hellenization and an adoption of Greco-Roman ideals, the Jewish people faced a dichotomy. Should they assimilate, go Greek, but risk forsaking their traditions and heritage? Many desired reformation, to go back to the rich theological heritage of being a separate people from the nations of the earth, guided by the one God who liberated them from slavery in Egypt. In cries of deliverance, then, the Jewish people in the early first century AD came to expect the imminent arrival of a Messiah figure, one representing the prophet figure Moses promised to Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God. I will raise up for them a prophet like you among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Deuteronomy chapter 18. This figure, when he appeared, would liberate all Judea and all the Jewish people from foreign rule. He would rededicate the temple of Yahweh and consecrate its grounds, and he would reign as God's anointed king forever. Christians know this Messiah to be Jesus of Nazareth, God in the flesh. We can really take off from two points here. We can go the Christological route, explaining how Jesus did, in fact, do the things written of the Anointed One in Hebrew Scripture. But truth be told, I have lots of sermons on this channel that do that just fine. What I'd like to explore in this video is the Jewish perspective of those who either rejected this Jewish Messiah, missed him altogether, or did not know of his arrival. This is important and worth discussion because the state of Judea after the life and death of Jesus was radically changed. Many a Caesar were seen as divine and worthy of inclusion in the Roman pantheon and the imperial cult. In fact, many of them were given the title Son of God. But all of a sudden, another challenger stands up to challenge this title given to Caesar, a Jew who had suffered a Roman crucifixion, whose followers believed that he had risen from the dead and had taken his seat in the heavenly places until all strongholds on earth came into subjection to his will. This is just the Christians, though. Many Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah and opted to remain under the tried-and-true covenant system of the Levitical priesthood, in service to Yahweh at the temple in Jerusalem. But even this system is destroyed altogether, falling to the hands of the Roman Empire, the Second Temple was completely destroyed under Roman General Titus in 70 AD. Not only did this completely change the trajectory of classical Jewish worship, many wondered if they had missed something. Many interpreted this destruction of the Temple in 70 AD as the final apocalyptic indicator from God before the end of the world. Others abandoned the precepts of Judaism once for all and were completely Hellenized, made Greek. But for the devout who remained, it required a hard re-examination of the Jewish scriptures to find out where the truth of God was, even in the midst of desolation. A renewed interest in the accounting, reading, and care of the Hebrew scriptures emerged, leading to some incredible historical works of literature that we have the pleasure of drawing from over 20 centuries later. 
Have you ever wondered, then, how did we get our compilation of the Hebrew Scripture? What did the destruction of the Second Temple do to change Jewish minds in the first century AD? No one doubts that the writings of the world's most influential book were written over a millennia and contain a variety of topics, ranging from the origins of humanity to the exact geometrics of sacred space for worship, to the unfurling of the one God directing mankind back toward himself in a long-standing arc of reconciliation. So what were the means of codifying these texts as both sacred and authoritative, and why were other writings not included? How can we know that the scripture we have is as good as coming from the mouth of God himself? What makes Hebrew scripture any more correct than the other cultures and religions of the world? Let's dive into these scholarly questions and explore the sacred canon of Hebrew scripture. Now, any theologian can give you a concise theological answer on how we received and were made sure of the canon of scripture, but I'm going to take you on a historical journey. Come on, you should know that's kind of my thing by now. Because alongside spiritual provision, of which there's plenty, there's also great historical effort made to both define and clarify the merits of the canon of scripture, and its preservation which holds its own weight both for skeptics and those in the scholarly realm. The latter perspective, the histories, will be the focus of this video, compiling critical historical sources and stacking them against what we have today as established canon. Our best historical source for this question, outside of the canon of scripture itself, also has much to say on the Judaism of the first century AD, both before and after the destruction of the Second Temple. He records the writings of extra-biblical commentary on the Hebrew Bible from the minds of gifted rabbis, from the first writings of the sacred texts until his own time. Writing from approximately 75 to 95 AD, Flavius Josephus was a Jewish scholar and general of royal and priestly descent, who after losing the Jewish-Roman war for Jewish independence from Rome in 66 to 70 AD, he actually defected to the Romans betraying his Hebrew race in a way, but consequently becoming a close partner and former to Titus, the then Roman general but future Roman emperor. Titus is most famous for having destroyed the second temple in Jerusalem in the year 70 AD, an absolute turning point both for Jews and Christians, even today. So we have a defector, then, who gave aid in the destruction of the temple, as one of our greatest historical sources for Jewish thought in the first century. That's not a very attractive source at first glance, but the works he produced have been of great significance for historians, a treasure trove for archaeologists and scholars alike. But he's also a treasure trove for corroborating New Testament figures such as James, the brother of Jesus. He makes an incredibly interesting comment on John the Baptist. He writes of Pontius Pilate, and even Jesus who was called Christ. As such, Josephus has been loved in Christian circles, adding his witness of these people as historical corroboration, as he is a non-biblical affirmation of New Testament writings. It's important to mention, Josephus himself was not a Christian, at least we don't think so, nor a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, but he was at least aware of his name and of the influence he made in the cultural zeitgeist of all Jewish people in the first century. Josephus otherwise gave a concise history of the Jewish people at the request of Vespasian, Emperor of Rome from 69 to 79 AD. Josephus recounts in incredible detail the complete history of the Jewish race, from creation to Abraham, the era of the patriarchs to Moses, the exodus to the conquest of Canaan, the united and divided monarchies and exiles of the tribes of Israel, even of Jewish history under the influence of figures like Cyrus the Great, Alexander the Great, Herod the Great, do you see a commonality here? All of those up until the near current time of writing. But he encapsulates his defense of the Jewish records with clear corroboration. In retelling the events recorded in the Torah, he links and even corrects understandings of the Jewish histories as told by other historians. He frequently cites and critiques Herodotus, a near contemporary of Socrates. But what's more interesting is that Josephus cites Manetto, an ancient Egyptian historian whose works would be completely lost to history 
if Josephus had not cited his works. It's sufficient to say, then, that the writings of Josephus are as important as they are exhaustive, and for good reason. The history of the Jewish people is complex, lengthy, dynamic, but it is also well-documented, accountable, consistent, adding a much-needed mature layer to the history of this ancient people. Now, Josephus is also in a bit of a tight spot, to be fair. He is absolutely hated by his fellow Jews, seen as even worse than a traitor by electing to serve the Romans rather than facing death. He's also generally disliked among polytheistic Greeks and Romans, those among the imperial cult who see the Jews and their monotheism as paranoia, binding, and basically one step away from real atheism. This backward people, they thought, who abstain from asceticism and games and the worship of the gods at love feasts, who opt rather to stay committed to their strict regulations concerning dietary laws and even days of rest, these were all seen as cumbersome and binding in the perspective of Greco-Romans who were otherwise free to do and believe whatever they wanted, so long as their loyalty to Caesar remained. Nevertheless, Josephus spends the latter years of his life defending the Jewish religion, facing scrutiny from other Jews and for his involvement in Roman domination of Judea, i.e. the destruction of the temple, but he's also seen as an outcast of sorts among his Roman cohorts for remaining Jewish. It's an interesting mix, to be sure, but here's what he says regarding the canon of Hebrew scripture. It follows, seeing that with us it is not open to everybody to write the records, and that there is no discrepancy in what is written, seeing that, on the contrary, the prophets alone had this privilege, obtaining their knowledge of the most remote and ancient history as they learned of God himself by inspiration, and committing to writing a clear account of the events of their own time just as they occurred. It follows, I say, that we do not possess myriads of inconsistent books, conflicting with each other, as the Greeks have. Our books, those which are justly accredited, are but two and twenty, and contain the record of all time. This passage is part of a larger rebuttal of Josephus to Apion Moctos, hence the name of the work, Against Apion. Apion was known in his own right as the foremost interpreter of Homer's works in the first century AD, contributing greatly to cultural understandings of Homeric works such as Iliad and Odyssey. But Apion was also a forceful critic of the Jewish religion, insisting that Jewish people under Roman subjection did not deserve the special rights and privileges that they had enjoyed under a Roman authority, such as a waiver from worshipping the Greco-Roman pantheon and observing the Sabbath. The point Josephus makes in his rebutting work is clear, agreeing with Jewish thought both of the past and present, that divine, authoritative revelation from God manifesting in the recording of scripture was made possible only through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of the God of Israel. Working through prophets of their respective times, from Moses to Malachi, these men were given an accurate rendering of the histories, law, and poetic works. This is actually why, Josephus argues, that the Greeks, Egyptians, Assyrians, all other kingdoms of the earth, do not have clear, concise accountability of their histories. Though Josephus admits that prophetic inspiration from God ceased after the time of the Ecumenid king Artaxerxes, who was a rough contemporary of the prophet Malachi, writing in the same time frame of 435 BC, he charges that everything up to that time, following the concise successive line of the prophets, was regarded as sacred decree from the mouth of God, and is counted as more trustworthy than the works of any other peoples on the face of the earth. Again, Josephus makes the confident assertion of the authority of the scriptures in another quote from Against Apion. How firmly we have given credit to these books of our own nation is evident by what we do, for during so many ages as have already passed, no one has been so bold as either to add anything to them to take anything from them, or to make any change in them. But it has become natural to all Jews immediately, and from their very birth, to esteem these books to contain divine doctrines, and to persist in them, and, if occasion be, willingly die for them. For it is no new thing for our captives, many of them in number and frequently in time, 
to be seen to endure racks and deaths of all kinds upon the theaters, that they may not be obliged to say one word against our laws and the records that contain them. Now, for anyone who noticed, Josephus was quoted earlier as defining 22 books of Hebrew scripture, whereas the English Bible contains 39 books in the Old Testament. Why the disparity? Well, not to worry, this is really just a preference in language and arrangement. It's not so much having to do with a change of content. No, that has stayed consistent. But it was normal in ancient writings to combine and consolidate the writings of, say, the Twelve Minor Prophets into one large volume. All that we've done in English is divide up the Minor Prophets into their own books, helping to keep clear which prophet is being read through the prophecies and content then and now are rendered exactly the same. Another common combination was the prophet Jeremiah and the Book of Lamentations. This prophet decries the imminent destruction of Judah in captivity by the Babylonians, and the Lamentations of Jeremiah are the mournings of a devastated, once prosperous nation following these events. 1st and 2nd Samuel is another common combination. The scribes of Josephus' day would have combined these writings into one scroll, only called Samuel. While we have split this into two volumes, with its focus on Samuel and Saul in the first volume, and then David more so in the second volume. Josephus lists his justly accredited books of the sacred canon as follows. Number one, the five books of Moses, indisputable. These cover a complete history of the Jewish people from creation to the death of Moses. Number two, the 13 prophetic books, that were written by men under the guiding hand of the Holy Spirit to accurately account the histories of their days. These are Joshua, Judges, and Ruth is one book, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah and Lamentations, that is, as a single book, Ezekiel, the Twelve Minor Prophets as a single book, Job, Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah as a single book, Chronicles, and finally, Esther. These make up the prophetic writings. Josephus' third category are the books of hymns and precepts, containing the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs. These make up the authoritative canon of the Hebrew scriptures, made possible only through the holy authoritative spirit of God, who, in Josephus' view, will continue to guide his chosen people through his elected means of redemption. If you learned something new in this video, or you want to know more about Josephus, let me know in the comments below. I had a lot of fun making this video, and what's going to be the first part of my Second Temple series, following important events that follow the people of Yahweh leading up to the destruction of the Temple in 70 AD. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next video, and Jesus is King.